three words to sum up the current moment. Chaotic. Mind-blowing. <laughs> Is that two words or one? Um, unreal. Fun. And interesting. It's always something new. It's always something different. So I feel like that my three words. Emphasis on the chaotic. <laughs> Bold and underlined that far. <laughs> yeah, so we met in prison. Um, we both had made some not so great choices. Um, had a rough go of it until that point. Um, and then met in a computer class in prison. So we like to joke that we met in college because <laughs> it's like a giant dorm room. And yeah. a bunch of drama. We're taking college courses. And college so courses. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we met in a, in a computer networking class in prison. Yeah, I think it was always very natural for us. I think that it's, I think regardless of the, the situation or like the setting, I guess, that it would have been the same, yeah. I think. Um, and we instantly were just like, oh my God. Like you get me and you're like the other piece that fits into what I know. And like, we have the same sense of humor. And I think we've just always had a lot of fun and um, it just never ended. We just like kept going yeah. and it kept evolving and we got out and we wanted to continue doing it. <laughs> and then it just became normal. We did what everybody else, you know, we got a yeah. job, we got a crappy apartment. Yeah. Got a was, better job, got a better place. I really feel like there was a ton of, of course, lessons that come out of prison, but I feel like that's like the biggest defining moment for me anyway. Like I learned a lot of personal lessons, um, but I think in big picture, like that was the point. Like this was the point. When we left prison, we left prison entirely so that that door was shut we took with us what we gained from it and left what didn't serve us anymore and so there's there's a term when you leave prison and it's called hitting the bricks and it's you're done like you're hitting the ground running and you know so it was like once you hit the bricks you're you're not supposed to look back and i don't think that we did and i feel like it we just you start the moment like this is who i am in the present moment and your past didn't matter and the future wasn't as important because it was just going to unfold. Um, yeah, the transition out of prison and back into real life um, was hard. And I think that we forget how difficult it was. And I think that we're the type of people who just get it together and find a way. Um, but it was really difficult. It was difficult to find a job. It was difficult to find an apartment. We couldn't rent anywhere. Uh, we couldn't work anywhere. Um, we couldn't get a car anywhere. So we we worked really hard um, just to just to even start to get kind of like the basics of, of the job, the house, a car, a way to get around and stuff. If you're a felon, you're not necessarily a bad person, or what you did is not who you are. And I think that's because the vast majority of people are not making the same choices post prison. And we have a lot of room to grow as far as people being able to get out and be successful on their personal side, but then also for people to make room in the community, for people to kind of live down <laughs> what they did, especially for people like us who did it when we were 18 years old. To get where we are now as parents, um, we had explored some other options and gone down some other potential paths um, and things just were not working out. It was not panning out the way we had planned. Um, and so we actually, right, right before we found out about Oakley, we had gone camping and we were on the way back. We had like no cell phone service yet at this point, we had just left. And we started having a conversation of, I think we need to talk about like, this just isn't gonna happen for us. And we're really trying and now we're getting to the point where we're getting like super excited only to be let down over and over and it's becoming really stressful and maybe this just isn't meant to be um and that's okay we have to find a way to be okay and, and move past that and know that maybe this just won't happen um 
and then and then we got a phone call <laughs> like on that same car on ride. the way back like this like we yeah. just had finished that conversation and as soon as we got service she started getting text messages and stuff yeah and then my mom called me she said she texted me and said call me so i called my mom and she said oh your cousin and his girlfriend just had a baby and you know they're homeless and the baby was born with drugs in her system and she's going into foster care and i made a crude joke <laughs> as i do and I said, we're baby hungry lesbians, we'll take it. <laughs> and my mom called my grandmother and my grandmother called my cousin. And the next day I'm messaging with my cousin and we're going to the hospital to meet her. Um, and I think that from that first moment, we realized that this was gonna be a fight because my cousin said, I told my cousin, we'll take her. And he said, you can't take her, you're a felon. And I, I instantly thought, that's right, we're a felon. We don't get to do things like this. Like no one's ever gonna let us just take a baby from this state. We're a felon, we're terrible people, we're pariahs in their eyes. Um, and then two days later, I just had this weird feeling come over me as I was working in the middle of a lunch rush in the restaurant that I ran. And it told me to call the hospital. So I called the hospital and they put us in touch. And I think it was the following day, that makes four days after we found out about her, that we were able to bring her home um, under very strange conditions. <laughs> we called the hospital and they said, oddly enough, we're placing her in foster care in an hour. Can you be here for the meeting? And I was like, absolutely. So my mom and I drive to the DHS building and they tell us, you can't, you can't take her because you're a felon. And my mom raised her hand and said, I'll take her. And she can stay with me and the girls can move in with me while you work it out. And that's what we did. My mom took her, we moved in with my mom, we left her brand new house, moved in with my mom to sleep in a back bedroom on a twin mattress with this baby. <laughs> um, and they just kept telling us, no, the best you'll get is what they call allocation of parental rights. And that is where the parents continue to be the legal guardians for the rest of their life. And we are just placement and we have no say over them, and they essentially are glorified foster kids in our home. And we are at the whim of the parents to make all the decisions. Um, and they cited what they call volume seven, which is the law that there's, doesn't allow violent felons, quote unquote, to, to adopt. And they kept telling us, volume seven, you can't do this, you can't do this. And I was reading it so differently than them. And I just said, we need help. So we hired an attorney and she jumped on it and she told DHS, you, you don't have the right to practice law or inter to interpret law. And this is a violation of their civil rights. And we're filing a federal lawsuit against you for violating civil rights if this isn't looked at. And very quickly they looked at it. <laughs> Getting from, if you don't look at this, to them actually looking at it took yeah. about two years of us just waiting and then telling yeah. us the entire time, you will never adopt, you will never adopt, you will never adopt. The answer was just no, no from the beginning. Just is, no. Like you can, and, <laughs> you can help, <laughs> but you can never fully yeah. do it. Um, yeah, so it so. took a long, long time and a lot of just amazing bulldogging by our attorney <laughs> to, to get things to change. To be completely honest, I don't know where it happened. It was, it was, there was discussions and there was a lot of feedback from the very, very high ups of the Department of Human Services that just said, this is an absolute no. And then we just went into court one day and our lawyer just said, you know, your honor, this is what we're dealing with. And the judge just looked at them and said, that's my decision, not yours. And I think it was the first time that it was put in front of a judge. And it was the first time that both sides kind of put their cards on the table about this is our stance. And, and I think the judge was the one that just looked at it and said, well, what's legal, what's constitutional and what's not. And it, so I think it was getting in front of the judge for the first time, um, but we didn't get to do that until they terminated parental rights. So until the rights are terminated, you, you can't even talk about adoption because the parents have a choice and, and, a, and a ability to come back and take the baby back at any point in that yeah. one so to I two think, years. Yeah, I think the first couple of years were so 
amazing, um, but very stressful because we lived in this constant fear of like, they could come back at any point and they were at that point, I'll say semi loosely involved. Um, but as far as like the legal stuff, we were, we were just going on blind faith. Like we've got to find a way to make this work. Like, I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to hire a lawyer. We're going to, we're going to argue until our freaking eyes fall out. Like we're going to just do everything we can. And so we kind of just went in hoping and waited that it was going to work the way as, we wanted yeah, to as as bad as it sounds we had to wait for the parents to fail you know and and you never wish that and that's i think the worst part about this whole situation is that there's the good part of you you're doing this great service and you're keeping these kiddos together and you're nursing them back to health from the horrible conditions they were born in um and and becoming a mom instantly. So you feel everything. If anybody's a parent at all, you will die for your child. So there's this weird duality that's like, I don't wanna wish badly on another human being, but I so badly just want these people to hurry up and fail. Mm -hmm. So I can do the job that I'm here to do and that is to be the parent. And so it was this really weird and morally confusing time right <laughs> like um and everything was just banking on another person's failure and i think living that way for two years you you really start to see the best and the worst of yourself you know of, of your own version of or own opinion of humanity this is okay, Oakley is so goofy. Um, she's funny. She's sassy. Theatrical. She's very theatrical. <laughs> oh, hi. She's so tough and so sensitive all at the same time. Like, she's like this real strong exterior, and then underneath, she's like a big, soft, squishy ball of cute um, mush. I'm going to show you my Barbie dream house now. I don't know. She's I one think... of my most favorite people in the whole world. <laughs> I think, to, did she just say she had a favorite? No. <laughs> I, I think to sum out. Oakley up, oh, as long as see you see are see looking at her oh, and cheering her time. on, she's good. She has just put on this earth to perform in every fashion and to just bring happiness to everybody around her. And she really doesn't care about anything else but having fun and making people smile. I think so far Oakley has the best sense of humor or a sense of humor, well, similar to mine, so it has to be the best. Um, but she just tells these funny little jokes and I'm like, how does she, how she's so smart and she understands like sarcasm. She's quick. She's super quick witted and so you can tell jokes and she gets them and she'll joke, like tell a joke back to you. Um, she brought home from school she she told Danielle, I have a surprise. I got brownies at school. Do you want one? And so Danielle was like, yeah, of course. She unzips her backpack and it's a brown letter E. And she said, here's a brownie, mom. Like, ha get it. Oh, you know, thank like, you. I was just so pleased with herself that she told this cute little joke. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, that's pretty much her. She's a big ball of fun. Yeah, definitely. Oh, um, how are you excited about Ernest um, Black Caesar? Ernest Caesar? Uh, I thought you your sister. Yes, because she's being mean to Zilda. Oh, um, Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln. Give me a high five. We had, Lincoln, we had speculated that um, Birth Mom may be pregnant again um, with Lincoln. We didn't know at the time Lincoln, but um, so we had wondered for a few months. The way we confirmed it was she was arrested mm -hmm. and she went into county jail pregnant. And she was very pregnant. She was eight or nine, eight, probably eight months pregnant eight months. Yeah. Um, at that point. So we had wondered for quite a few months and then, and then found out for sure then. Yeah. And then it was crunch time <laughs> to get ready for a baby and just, just a few. Mm -hmm. Just just a couple weeks, actually, is what we really had to get ready for baby to come. Oh my gosh, Lincoln is... Lincoln is 
a softy in the best of ways. He's sweet and loving. Um, but he also has like a, a feisty, a fight in him. Like he'll, he stands up for himself, but loves so much. He has such a special place in my heart because he's such a special and dynamic little kid. He is. Lincoln has the most issues out of all of them, which is ironic because he had the least amount of exposure um, and the most time sober before birth, but he, he unfortunately has had the brunt of it. So he struggles a lot in life. And I think right now, a lot of his defining qualities are overcoming what was done to him and, and what happened to him before he came yeah. to be. Um, but he is smart. He's, he's, he's so testing smart in the four and five year old level. And he's not even three yet. He is outrageously smart um, and very independent. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then I get so. a phone call. <laughs> I get a phone call. It was, um, we actually went to court that day and they said, we're kicking you over to adoption. You'll get a phone call from them today. There was a light. We were almost yeah. done. And so I was in an appointment for one of the kids and I missed the call. So I call him back very like peppy and excited to talk to adoption. And I was like, hey, this is Danielle. And they say, yeah, so this is such and such from, you know, Penrose St. Francis Hospital. And we're calling because Crystal's baby is ready to come home. And I had a moment where I was like, oh, you're so confused. We already have her babies. <laughs> we're good. Um, and they were like, no, there's another one. And um, she's been in the NICU for three weeks and she's ready to be released. Will you take her? And it was unreal. It, it didn't it even like make sense. The it was... scramble was on to <laughs> get ready fast. Yeah. It was an hour of phone calls of trying to bring everything together. And I actually didn't call my wife for an hour. I was so busy making phone calls to everybody else with the department and everything getting things. And I said, oh my gosh, I have to call my wife and tell her we have another baby. I just said yes without even talking to her. It was so natural for us. <laughs> Nurgle is a spitfire. She is the feistiest, most spirited little kid. She's so funny. Oh, can you lay on this? <laughs> She's sweet and so cuddly and smart all at the same time. She's just really like a dynamic ball of energy and sass and intelligence all mixed up into one cute little baby. She's so amazing to be around. Um, taking on three kids in our situation and in their situation, I think presents a whole list of its own challenges. Um, but then you throw in the pandemic, which I think <laughs> complicated, added this extra layer of complication on top of everything. And so we weren't making progress court-wise. Um, Margot's court dates, they were considering non-essential. And so everything with her paused for five, or six, five, probably five months. Um, sh we were, we were, we were here all the time, all five of us. And so I think that really added this cool factor of like getting to really <laughs> yeah. bond and spend like so much quality time yeah. together. But then like this other like dark side of that, of like, we're here all day, every day together. <laughs> like yeah. it's awesome and like stressful at the same time. Our days are crazy. Just they're, they're crazy busy, they're crazy fun, they're crazy stressful, they're crazy everything, right? We have three little balls of energy um, with, you know, very high medical needs and very high therapeutic needs. And so it's up and keeping everybody entertained and, and rushing off to this appointment and that appointment and trying to collectively get all kids, you know, to nap and all kids fed and, you know, spaghetti off all of the kids' bodies all of the time. Um, but it's it's crazy fun in the way that it's it's never dull and they're always playing and always having fun. We're always laughing yeah. and finding some kind of like 
humor um, in the chaos, which I think is the only way to survive. And we have three toddlers at this point. So it's, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a mess a lot of times in a good way, Figurative but- Figurative and literal. Yeah. I think that we always have been really good at finding a way to have fun. Like no matter, no matter what, no matter what's going on. I would do it all again a hundred times over. What about you? Um, <laughs> I feel like there are days when I question if I would have known how much work it would be, would I have had the strength to say yes? In those moments when you're being very honest with yourself, just, I never thought that life would look like this. And there's so much joy, but there is this very taxing side that um, I think has changed who we are as people, who we are as a couple, who we are as a family. Um, the answer is always yes when I search deep down. Um, but I think that just being honest about the level of difficulty that sometimes you do question, like, <laughs> would I be crazy enough to do it if I knew going into it how hard it would be? Um, but the yes. The now is that you know them and you love them. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, it's, yes, I it's would worth do it now. <laughs> My hopes for the kids in the future, I think that they're so stripped down. I just want them to be healthy and happy and adjusted. I have zero expectations of my children other than they be kind human beings. Um, and I just, I just hope that they, they take this life with as much strength and ferocity as they did saving their own lives the day they were born. I want them to feel good about themselves and, and happy no matter no matter what. And so I think that that's what we're trying to, to do is just raise good, kind, happy people that feel comfortable to be themselves. And I think that's the biggest part for us is we're always like, be you, you know, like whatever, whatever that means. We're not gonna tell you who to be, just be yourself and, and be happy because that's what matters more than anything. I think messy hope would, could be a tagline for our entire life at this point. Um, messy in the literal sense, messy in a figurative sense that this has been like just a crazy journey of these ups and downs, but hope has always been the constant. As messy as it has gotten, I think we always just push through hoping and knowing that we were gonna find a way to make it out. Yeah. It is very much that, like you live in fear and there's this internal mess because you're just blindly loving these beautiful babies, never knowing if they're gonna stay with you or not and just living every moment like they are yours before they even are yours legally. And I think that that embodied kind of this whole thing. Like we just decided that we were gonna go in and we were going to succumb to the worst if that happened, but hope for the best. Yeah. And we've always just been hoping for the best. We love them. And we always have, and we always will. Um, and we just want them to be happy and know that they are worth it. I feel like, oh God, she got me crying. You're amazing. You'd, I don't even have to be around to know that. And I'm always here, even when I'm not. And I just believe in you.